I'll take a few moments to recall our motivation. So, um, what I thought to do was to just read together the text of Lama Tsongkhapa's Illumination. I hope everybody brought it. Um, and <clears throat> clarify any points that are not clear. I didn't take many notes during the uh, teachings of Geshe Lundrup. I just took a few here and there. Um, so if any of you did take notes, and if there's something you see in your notes that is puzzling, <laughs> or whatever, not clear, then, you know, when we get to that point of the text, um, we can, you know, stop and talk about that and see if we can clarify it. So that's my idea, and we'll see how it goes. Um, because we have, what, six weeks, six sessions, so... <clears throat> I, I think it's really nice to read Lama Tsongkhapa's um, words. It's, it's very auspicious. And uh, when I read them, I feel, wow, he really is an incredible scholar. And sometimes the language is hard to understand. But remember, this is 600 years ago. You know, if you read Shakespeare, <laughs> it's just a different way of talking, right? So... Um, actually, I find it easier to understand Shakespeare. <laughs> so, uh, but maybe that's because I've been studying Buddhism for a long time. But anyway, um, but we'll, anyway, we'll just try the best we can to um, clarify whatever is not clear. And um, some of you may not know it, but <clears throat> Jeffrey's translation of the, the Illumination, the first five chapters of this text, were published a long time ago. This was in the library, published in 1980. And there's another version, which I did see one day, but I didn't find it yesterday. It's got a red cover. Did anyone see that one? Kind of a bright red cover with a picture on it. I, yeah, anyway, I don't know which one came first, but uh, they're both by Snow Lion. Snow Lion tends to change their covers sometimes, and it almost looks like it's a different book, but it is the same book. But anyway, the version that we have has some changes to it, so it's better that we follow <coughs> follow that version. And it looks like it's still a work in progress. He's still uh, working on it. So first, just a little bit of background of this text, and some of you may not fully know that. Um, so it starts with the Buddha. <coughs> The Buddha gave many teachings over like 45 years, I think. And among his teachings are a set of sutras called the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. There isn't just one, but there's many Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. And um, these are among the most important sutras in the Mahayana tradition. <clears throat> and... Um, it said that the explicit subject matter of the sutras is emptiness, emptiness of inherent existence. That's the main thing that's being talked about. Emptiness, 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 emptiness. <laughs> again and again, as you can see in the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra is uh, one of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. It's one of the shortest ones. So that's so emptiness is the explicit subject matter, the explicit meaning. <clears throat> There's also said to be an implicit or hidden meaning of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, and that is the actual path, the stages of the path that a bodhisattva needs to progress along in order to reach enlightenment. So these two things then, the explicit meaning and the implicit meaning, constitute the two wings of the bird. Uh, wisdom and method, as we sometimes call them. And then about 400 years after the Buddha passed away, Nagarjuna appeared. He was actually prophesied by the Buddha. They, they say there was 
a time when the Buddha prophesied that this person would would come. And um, he wrote a number of texts to clarify the explicit meaning of the perfection wisdom sutras, in other words, emptiness. So he, so he mainly wrote texts about emptiness because it seems that at the t maybe at the time of Buddha there were people who got it, you know, who just by listening to the Buddha's teachings understood emptiness. But after, you know, as time went on, people's minds degenerated, and <laughs> it was not so easy. I would imagine, too, that just being in the presence of the Buddha, you know, just being there with the Buddha when he's talking about this, that must have had a tremendous power, you know, to help people get the realizations. But so as time went on, it became more and more difficult for people to get the realizations. So that is why it was important or even necessary for Nagarjuna to um, <clears throat> clarify the meaning of emptiness. So he wrote many texts um, about emptiness. And then a few centuries after Nagarjuna, <clears throat> um, Maitreya and the Sangha wrote a number of uh, texts to clarify the hidden meaning of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, the stages of the path. <clears throat> so, for example, the Abhi Samayalamkara is one of the main texts that explain the actual path the Bodhisattva follows to enlightenment. And um, so in the monasteries, like in Sara Monastery and Drepo Monastery and so on, <clears throat> they study these two... Um, these two subject matters of the, the hidden meaning and the uh, explicit meaning of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. And so for the, um, the explicit meaning, emptiness, um, they don't study Nagarjuna's text. Instead, they study this text by Chandrakirti. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so... Um, now, one of Nagarjuna's texts, one of his main texts, is called the Mula Madhyamaka, <laughs> Mula Madhyamaka Shastra, or the Fundamental Treatise on the Middle Way. And um, so after he wrote that text, other scholars, other Indian scholars, wrote commentaries to it, but they interpreted it in different ways. For example, there were some who would interpret what he said, because in those days they didn't even have school. They, there was no names of Om Madhyamika Prasangika and Chitta Matra and so on. They didn't have the names of these schools. So, you know, Nagarjuna wrote his text, but then, you know, different people explained what he was saying, but they explained it in different ways. So some explained it according to the mind-only school, the Chitta Matra school. And others, for example, Baba Viveka, explained it according to what later became known as the Svatantrika Madhyamika school. And um, so Chandrakirti, I can't remember how many centuries he appeared after Nagarjuna. Anyone remember? I don't remember. Anyway, he came later. <laughs> and, um, and he wrote this text called Madhyamika Vatara, or Supplement to the Middle Way. Actually, he wrote two commentaries to Nagarjuna's mm, fundamental treatise. One is called Clear Words, Pasanapada, I think. I don't know if there's an English translation of that. I haven't heard of one. Um, that was one of his texts. And that's like a word commentary. I think he's just going word for word through Nagarjuna's text and explaining it. The other text that Chandrakirti wrote is, is this uh, Madhyamika Vatara, the supplement to the middle way. So in the monasteries, um, that's the text that they study. They study Chandrakirti's Madhyamika Vatara, <coughs> uh, which is a commentary in turn to Nagarjuna's text, The Fundamental Wisdom, which in turn is a commentary to the Buddha's Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. So that's kind of the rough lineage of, of this text. And then in Tibet, Lama Tsongkhapa wrote a commentary to Chandrakirti's uh, Madhyamika Avatara. So that's what this text is, Illumination. Um, and it does include the main verses of Chandrakirti's text. <coughs> it's a big text. So Chandrakirti's text has 11 chapters. 
The first ten chapters relate to the ten bhumis, the ten grounds of a bodhisattva. So there's one chapter for each of the ten bhumis. And then the eleventh chapter is about Buddhahood, the, the final goal, the state of a Buddha. So it's quite a vast text, a lot of, especially chapter six. <laughs> chapter six is uh, about the perfection of wisdom. So that's huge. Probably takes up two thirds of the whole text. And mm -hmm. it's all the different reasonings on refuting inherent existence and so on. Tough stuff. Wikipedia places Tanakhurti at 680, 680. 600. Okay, so that's about 500 years after uh, Nagarjuna, because Nagarjuna was in first first century common era, I think. <clears throat> anyway, Tibetans don't seem to care about these kind of things. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> they don't keep track of numbers and dates and so on, but. <clears throat> okay, so that's a little bit of a background. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Is that clear? I mean, you don't have to know all this stuff, but it's just helpful to know. So let's start to look at the text. This is, again, um, Lama Tsongkhapa's commentary to Chandrakirti's Madhyamika Avatar. <coughs> And so, in the beginning, there are these verses of homage. I'm not. I'm not going to read all the titles and everything. But just I think on page. What page is this? Oh, don't have page numbers. Huh. Um, <laughs> maybe anyway, it starts with homage, and then there are these verses. So here he's paying paying homage to the um, the the great masters who came before and um, uh, clear, you know, explain and clarify these teachings. So he says, I bow down and go for refuge with great respect to the feet of the revered Guru Manjugosha, another word, another name for Manjushri, and the father, the superior Nagarjuna, and his sons. May I always be protected by the monarch of subduers, that's the Buddha, <clears throat> Son of all teachers, treasure of all eloquent exposition of the profound and vast. So profound refers to emptiness, vast refers to the method side of the path. Development of compassion, bodhicitta, first five perfections and so on. <clears throat> Unusual friend of all the world, I revealing the good path to transmigrators on the three levels. Uh, three levels, three levels. Yeah, there's different ways of saying that. Desire realm, form realm, formless realm, or also below the earth, on the earth, above the earth. <laughs> different ways, three levels can be explained. Anyway, all beings. May I always receive the blessed empowerment from Guru Manjugosha, source of profundity in the retinue of countless conquerors, unequaled in proclaiming the lion's roar of right discourse supreme. Homage from my heart to the prophesied Nagarjuna, who explained as it is the middle path of dependent <coughs> arising, free from extremes, the mind essence of those gone to bliss, the Buddhas, in the past, present, and future. Hold me then with the hook of sympathy. Homage to the feet of the glorious Aryadeva, who ascended to high rank through the Protect, through that protector's instructions, protector meaning Nagarjuna, Aryadeva was a disciple of Nagarjuna, <clears throat> attaining dom dominion of discourse, teaching the good path, clarifying for transmigrators what he had realized. I bow down with my head to the feet of Buddha Palita, who accomplished the word of the revered Manjugosha, illuminated the final thought of the superior Nagarjuna, and proceeded to a place of knowledge bearer adepts. Homage to the Honorable Chandrakirti as well as Shantideva, who completely and perfectly revealed the path of the great sage, subtle and hard to realize, the extraordinary essentials of Nagarjuna's system, 
Having seen well with the eye of stainless intelligence all the meanings of the uncommon essentials in the tenets of Nagarjuna and Aryadeva and commentaries of the three great chariots, uh, three gate, it sounds like three great chariots are Buddha, Palita, Bhava Viveka, and Chandrakirti. In order to remove the corruptions by the pollutions of expositions, by most who sought to explain the system, and since others have requested it, I will explain at length in full and correctly the supplement to the middle way. Or sorry, supplement to the middle. Here I will explain in accordance with his own commentary. So Chandrakirti composed this text, the uh, uh, supplement to the middle way, Madhyamika Avatar, and he also wrote an auto-commentary to it, his own commentary to it. I have a translation of that, if anyone's interested. It was made by Venerable George Chernoff. And um, so that is his own commentary to his own text. <laughs> they do that sometimes. <clears throat> so it seems that Lama Tsongkhapa is saying here is that he took Chandrakirti's supplement to the middle way, and then he took Chandrakirti's own commentary, and using that as a basis, he composed this text. Uh, a great text delineating without error the profound and the vast. The explanation has four parts, the meaning of the title, obeisance of the translators, meaning of the text, and meaning of the conclusion. So I think in the root text, Chandrakirti's Madhyamika Avatar, there are no outlines. There are in the like auto commentary has outlines, but anyway, it does it does help to have outlines to sort of break the text into sections and explain what's going on here and so on. <clears throat> okay, first is the meaning of Chandrakirti's title, which is the Madhyamika Avatar. In Sanskrit, one of the four language families of India, the title of this treatise is Madhyamika Avatara Nama. Translated into Tibetan is Umala Jupa Shejawa, which in English is supplement to the middle, or more fully, as will be explained, supplement to Nagarjuna's treatise on the middle. Because the word middle, Uma in Tibetan or Madhyamaka in Sanskrit, can refer to different things. So here, um, Lama Tsongkhapa is saying, in the, in the title of Chandrakirti's text, the middle is actually referring to Nagarjuna's text, the fundamental wisdom of the middle way. So he says, the middle that is supplemented here is Nagarjuna's treatise on the middle, Madhyamaka Shastra, because Chandrakirti says, in order to supplement the treatise on the middle, and so on. Furthermore, when in his own commentary, Chandrakirti cites Nagarjuna's fundamental treatise on the middle called Wisdom, that's a more full title of Nagarjuna's text. Sometimes it's called Root Wisdom. I've seen it translated into English as Root Wisdom. So if you ever hear of Nagarjuna's Root Wisdom, it's this text. It's the same one. As a source, uh, he frequently says, from the middle. <clears throat> in accordance with this, the middle should be taken as Nagarjuna's fundamental treatise on the middle called wisdom, not other texts on the middle or any of the other meanings of Madhyamaka, such as a person holding the tenets of the middle or the tenets themselves. So these are other meanings of Madhyamaka. Madhyama can, can refer to a person, although I think in English there we say Madhyamika, <laughs> a person who follows this school as a Madhyamika, but it's probably the same in, I don't know, anyway. And, it, and that term can also refer to the tenets themselves, like the Madhyamaka uh, school of tenets. But in this context, it's referring to um, Nagarjuna's text. Also, in his lamp for Nagarjuna's wisdom, Bhava Viveka explains that based on the... Do you know Bhava Viveka? Have you heard of him? 
So I guess he was one of the commentators after Nagarjuna, and he wrote a text, I think it's called Blaze of, Blaze of Reasoning or something. I think His Holiness has been teaching that in Dharmasala. So Baba Viveka wrote a text explaining Nagarjuna, but it seems that his way of explaining was this Phatantrika school. And then, so he's, he's said to be the founder of the Madhyamika Svatantrika, the other one, other than Prasangika. <laughs> and uh, again, why Chandrakirti felt the need to write his text to explain, no, that's not what Nagarjuna meant. <laughs> he meant this. <laughs> so Chandrakirti is credited as being the founder of the Prasangika system. <clears throat> Anyway, Baba Vega is still an incredible great scholar. They have great respect for him. Baba Vega explains that based on the verbal root, ka meaning proclaim, of madhyamaka, the term madhyamaka indicates a middle treatise or middle tenets. Therefore, even though only the word madhyamaka appears in Chandrakirti's title, it should be understood here as the madhyamaka shastra, Nagarjuna's treatise on the middle. <clears throat> anyway, these are sort of technical details, but I guess there are people who wonder about these things, and so he's giving this explanation. Okay, now a question. I mean, this might be just a hypothetical question that somebody might ask. How does Chandrakirti's text supplement Nagarjuna's treatise on the middle? You might remember um, <clears throat> Gesh, Geshe Lundrup was talking about the term supplement, which is what Jeffrey, how Jeffrey translated this term jupa in um, Tibetan. Um, because jupa has other meanings. It can also mean engaging or entering. So there are other translations translations of Chandrakirti's text, and they say engaging in the middle way or entering in the middle way. So I think, I don't know if there was any conclusion, but Geshe Lundra was sort of questioning, uh, translating that term as supplement. But to me it makes sense. If you go, if um, the following explanation, it makes sense to say supplement. Anyway, so there's controversy about that, <laughs> using the word supplement. Okay. Response. Someone, seems to be Jayananda, I think he's one of the Indian uh, commentators, says that in the treatise, that's Nagarjuna's text, conventional and ultimate natures are not mentioned extensively, but that Chandrakirti teaches these two extensively here, whereby it supplements that treatise. This, does, this is not seen to be a good explanation. Because the forms of reasoning delineating suchness are far more extensive in Nagarjuna's fundamental treatise on the middle called wisdom than in Chandrakirti's supplement. Okay, so Lama Tsongkhapa doesn't accept Jayananda's explanation because he says no, and <clears throat> there's a lot more reasons about emptiness in Nagarjuna than in Chandrakirti. So it doesn't, Chandrakirti's text doesn't supplement in that way. <clears throat> Okay, so our own system on this is that Chandrakirti supplements Nagarjuna's treatise in two ways, from the viewpoints of the profound and of the vast. And now he's going to explain that. With respect to the first, Chandrakirti's auto-commentary says, the learned should determine that this system is uncommon and this supplement to Nagarjuna's treatise on the middle was also written for the sake of unmistakably indicating the suchness of the treatise because due to not understanding suchness, this profound doctrine is abandoned. <clears throat> now he goes on to explain. Thus, he composed the supplement to Nagarjuna's treatise on the middle way one, in order to show that the meaning of the middle that he ascertained is not shared with other proponents of the middle, specifically autonomists, the Svatantrika. Okay, so now, now uh, Lama Tsongkhapa is saying that one of the reasons Chandrakirti wrote this text is to 
um, to show clearly that you know n what Nagarjuna was talking about was not the way it's explained by the autonomous, like Baba Viveka and so on. So they got it wrong. I mean, well, maybe we shouldn't say they got it wrong, but <laughs> what he's saying is basically that's not what what Nagarjuna really meant. <clears throat> so that's one of the points that Chandrakirti was trying to make. Because there is extensive refutation in the text, in chapter 6, of the uh, autonomous system. Because they say that although things do not exist inherently on the ultimate level, they do exist inherently on the conventional level. So they don't completely eliminate or reject or negate inherent existence across the board. They're still hanging on to it. <laughs> in some way. And Chandrakirti says, no, you can't do that. That's wrong. Yeah, anyway. So, and then two, in order to indicate the determination that it is not suitable to explain the meaning of Nagarjuna's treatise in accordance with cognition only or mind only, the Chitamatra, Chitamatra school. So see, he also, in chapter six, Chandrakirti spends a lot of time refuting the, the Chitta Matra views of uh, no external objects and, you know, this alaya vijnana, vijnana and so on. <clears throat> okay, so, so basically Chandrakirti is just trying to explain what is the prasangika position. Although at that point in time, I don't know if the, that term prasangika actually existed, but... <laughs> that came later. But anyway, the prasangika position as opposed to the uh, svatantrika position and the chitta mantra position. What exactly do prasangikas uh, believe, assert? Then he says, uh, for Chandrakirti's clear words, that's his other text, which is a commentary to Nagarjuna's fundamental wisdom, the mode of dependent designation can be known from my supplement. And refutation of the cognition-only system, which was not done in length in Nagarjuna's treatise, or in Chandrakirti's clear words, is extensive here in the supplement. Therefore, good determination in dependence upon this text of the meaning of the treatise from the viewpoint of these two purposes is one way in which this text supplements the treatise. Okay. So Nagarjuna himself didn't clarify his position with respect to the mind-only school or respect to the Svatantrika school. Yeah. So Chandrakirti felt he needed to do that. Does that make sense? Is that clear? <clears throat> okay, so in short, one way in which this text supplement to the middle way supplements Nagarjuna's fundamental wisdom is from the point of view of the profound, distinguishing the real meaning of suchness or emptiness, uh, you know, with respect to the other schools, Chitamatra and uh, Svatantrika. Okay, then the vast. So with re re regard to how it supplements the treatise from the viewpoint of the vast in this system of the superior Nagarjuna, the presence or absence of the wisdom realizing the very profound suchness does not distinguish residing in the two vehicles, lower vehicle or great vehicle. And Nagarjuna's treatise, except for the topic of profundity, does not indicate the features of vastness in the great vehicle. Okay, so this, <laughs> this is a very long sentence. <laughs> Let's take it little by little. Um, so just to, some background to this. Um, um, according to the Prasangika view, as explained by Chandrakirti and Arjuna, uh, sorry, Maman Tsongkhapa and so forth, um, in order to become liberated from samsara, to reach nirvana, to reach, yeah, liberation, both liberation and enlightenment, 
one needs to realize the emptiness of inherent existence of all phenomena. Now, we've probably heard this many times, so we think, well, that's, that's right, of course. But the other schools, uh, from the Svatantrika down, do not hold that view. Instead, their view is that hearers and solitary realizers who aspire to attain nirvana, liberation from samsara, only have to realize uh, what's called coarse selflessness of persons, meaning the absence of a self-sufficient, substantially existent person. So that's, that's enough to get yourself out of samsara. You just have to realize there's no such thing as a <coughs> self-sufficient, substantially existent person. That's the person, that's the view of a person where the person seems like a kind of boss or a CEO or a king, you know, this feeling inside like this. Somebody's in charge, <laughs> an I that's in charge of everything. Okay, so you just have to realize the absence of that. You have to get rid of that misconception in order to get out of samsara, not have to be born anymore, and not have any more samsaric suffering, and so on. So this is what the other schools say, from Svatantrika on down. But the Prasangika school, and there's a big section about this that comes later in the text, doesn't agree with that. And they say that in order to, even for, even for hearers and solitary realizers to get out of samsara and become arhats, they have to realize emptiness, emptiness of inherent existence of all phenomena, both persons and everything else. So they're unique. That's like a, a unique view of the Prasangika school. That's the, that's, that's the view here. And Chandrakirti goes into great lengths to explain why that is so. <laughs> um, so in this te in Nagarjuna's text, Fundamental Wisdom, he's explaining the emptiness of inherent existence of all phenomena. So from that point of view, that is common. That is a common teaching for all vehicles, for both you know the great vehicle and the low vehicle, or what does Venerable Children call it? Fundamental vehicle? Yeah. Okay, fundamental vehicle and the great vehicle. Well, so the main subject matter of Nagarjuna's text, the fundamental wisdom, is emptiness. Emptiness of inherent existence of all phenomena, self, you know, persons as well as, as, well as phenomena. So that's mainly what he's teaching. So that teaching is actually common to both vehicles, fundamental vehicle and the universal vehicle, because everybody of all, all these vehicles has to realize that, has to understand that. According to Prasangika. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so the teaching then on emptiness of inherent existence of all phenomena isn't something that differentiates these two vehicles, the fundamental vehicle and the universal vehicle, right? That's not in the way in which you differentiate those two vehicles. I think that's what he's saying here. <laughs> Because he says, the presence or absence, going back to the second line of that paragraph, um, the presence or absence of the wisdom realizing the very profound suchness does not distinguish residing in the two vehicles. Okay, whether you're, you belong to that vehicle or you belong to that vehicle is indistinguished by whether or not you realize emptiness of inherent existence. Okay? And um, <clears throat> Nagarjuna's treatise except for the topic of profundity, does not indicate the features of vastness in the great vehicle. So Nagarjuna's fundamental, I haven't studied it, there's trans, translations of Nagarjuna's text, for example, Jay Garfield and a few others. Um, but anyway, in that text itself, he doesn't go into the vast side, the method side of the path. He doesn't talk about you know, how to develop compassion and bodhicitta and practice the first five perfections. So he doesn't talk about that, I guess, or maybe little bits here and there, but that's not um, a feature of that text. So he doesn't really talk about that, that side of the path for the great vehicle. Okay, then he says, nevertheless, this text, Nagarjuna's, was composed in terms of the great vehicle, 
So he's saying, it, Nagarjuna's text is a Mahayana text. It is a Mahayana text. Why? Um, from between the two vehicles, greater and lesser. So he says, one, because extensive teaching on the selflessness of phenomena through limitless variations of reasoning is done solely in terms of great vehicle trainees. And two, because the selflessness of phenomena is taught this way in Nagarjuna's fundamental treatise, da 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 da. So what he's saying here is that even though both the followers of the fundamental vehicle and the universal vehicle <coughs> need to realize emptiness of inherent existence of all phenomena, there's a difference in the way that they do so. The followers of the great vehicle need to use lots and lots of reasonings. He says limitless, <laughs> limitless variations of reasonings, many, many, many different reasonings in order to uh, understand emptiness. Whereas the followers of the uh, fundamental vehicle don't need so many reasonings. They can use just a couple of reasonings to... Um, and it comes later in the text why that is so. I can't remember exactly, but I think it might be because if you're a bodhisattva, you're following the bodhisattva's path, your goal is reaching enlightenment and then leading all sentient beings to enlightenment. Okay, so you want to be able to help all sentient beings become free of samsara and reach enlightenment. So it's useful to know lots of different reasons to explain emptiness so that you can teach them to different sentient beings according to their levels of... Uh, so I don't think it's so much that they themselves need lots of reasonings, otherwise it almost sounds like maybe they're less intelligent. <laughs> I don't think that's, that's the reason. It's, it's so that they can help sentient beings. I'll check and let you know later if that's the correct explanation, but it's so that you know, they can help all the other sentient beings to get out of samsara and reach nirvana and enlightenment. So they need to be able to teach in a very extensive way emptiness. Okay, so that, yeah, does that make sense? So he's, so Chandakirti is saying, this is proof that uh, Nagarjuna's text is a Mahayana text um, because it contains many, many, many reasonings for understanding emptiness. Then he says, it is also reasonable that the great vehicle, oh, oh, sorry, I skipped the line, the end of the previous paragraph, Chandrakirti also says this very clearly in the auto-commentary on the supplement, that's his own text. It is also reasonable that the great vehicle was taught for the sake of clarifying the selflessness of phenomena, because Buddha wished to give an extensive teaching of the selflessness of phenomena. In the hearer vehicle, the selflessness of phenomena is merely illustrated only briefly. This will be explained later. <clears throat> okay, then, thus, Chandrakirti thought it would be very good to fill in the gaps in the paths taught in that text, namely Nagarjuna's treatise on the middle supplying the other great vehicle paths of vastness by way of the quintessential instructions of the superior Nagarjuna. Hence, in order to fill these gaps, Chandrakirti set forth, then uh, the bullet points, the three practices on the level of a common being. Do you remember what those are? So, yeah, Chandrakirti talks a lot about compassion, as we're going to see soon, and um, bodhicitta, and then you know the the actual and the actual paths a bodhisattva <laughs> follows up to enlightenment. So that's the next bullet point: the ten grounds of a learner superior. What's a learner? Mm, I don't know if a learner has to be an arya. Here it says a learner superior, so that means a learner who is an Arya, but a, a learner is anyone who hasn't reached Buddhahood or who hasn't reached Arhatship, who's still learning, <laughs> still on the way. Well, usually, I mean, usually when the term comes up, it, meant, it means that, but I don't know if we could be considered learners. I think so, even if we haven't reached a path yet. <laughs> I thought it was another term for hearer. 
Um, I thought it was used that way. No. No, we're going to get to that soon, what, what hearers are. No, learner just means, because, you know, in the five paths, you know the five paths? The, the fifth path is called the path of no more learning. That's, that's the goal, either Buddhahood or being an arhat. And so, so the first four paths, then, you're still learning. You're a learner. <laughs> But yeah, maybe we we are too. Even before attain, you know, reaching the first path, we might still be learners. Anyway, so here it's talking about the ten grounds, the ten bumis of a bodhisattva. I mean, he doesn't mention bodhisattva, but they don't talk about ten grounds in the hearer and solitary realizer practice. I don't think that that's only a bodhisattva. Hmm? I don't think anywhere. Yeah, because actually they do say that the, there's a whole topic called salam, or grounds and paths, and they do say that ground and path are synonymous. Those two terms, ground and path, are synonymous. So you could say that, yes, yeah, the, the shravakas and solitary realizers have path, have grounds, but they don't have these ten grounds. They don't talk about ten grounds, they just talk about five. Somebody else was asking that. Okay, then the next point is the effect ground, meaning Buddhahood. The last point, the meditative cultivation. There's something wrong here. <laughs> Some mi- words missing. The meditative cultivation of special insight that through individual analytical wisdom, I think here we should put the word one, one investigates suchness. The two selflessnesses, independence on calm abiding, the entity of concentration, by way of the steps of the fifth and sixth grounds. Yeah, so when you get to chapters five and six, it talks about how to investigate um, suchness on the basis of calm abiding. So the union of calm abiding and special insight. So I guess Nagarjuna doesn't talk about that. In his fundamental wisdom. So these are ways, these are things that Chandrakirti has in his text, the supplement, which are not there, in Nag- at least not specifically. Maybe they're hidden <laughs> in Nagarjuna's text. And so that's why, like I say, I, I think supplement is a, is a good word um, to use rather than engaging, because Chandrakirti's text does supplement. It adds on things that were not specifically there in Nagarjuna's text. So then he says, therefore, if one, if when one takes to mind the meanings of Nagarjuna's fundamental treatise on the middle called wisdom, one is not mindful of these topics set forth in Chandrakirti's supplement and does not take to mind the stages of the path that are a composite of both the profound and the vast. The two purposes of the composition of the supplement are lost for such a person. Therefore, the supplementation of the paths of the treatise from the viewpoint of the vast independence upon this text is the second way it supplements the middle of Arjuna's treatise. <laughs> Again, if you have anything in your notes, that, like in the notes from Geshe Lundup's teachings, or... I do have one back there, but i got to figure it out first. But uh, So what we would say then is these were the implicit teachings in Nagarjuna's text. Well, I mean, they use those terms, explicit and implicit, with regard to the Perfection of Wisdom the Sutras. Hidden teachings, I, mean. I don't know. I haven't come across that. I mean, maybe it's okay to think that way, but he's not saying that here. So okay. don't think that Lama Tsongkhapa is saying that these teachings were actually hidden in Nagarjuna's and Chandrakirti is bringing them out. I, I mean, he's not explicitly saying that. It may be true. Isn't that what I thought? I guess I thought that's what the beginning of this part meant when they when you first started the intro and you talked about there were the explicit teachings about emptiness. That's about that. the perfection of wisdom. They say with perfection of wisdom sutras of the Buddha, they explicitly okay. teach emptiness, but implicitly they teach 
the paths. Mm-hmm. So they do say that with regard to the Perfection okay. Wisdom Sutras. But not with regard to Nagarjuna's. I haven't text. come across okay. that. It may be true. And there okay, may be yeah. some people who say that, yeah. but okay. he's not that's saying not, that. Okay. Thank you. That's, <laughs> so, that's what I need to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Did Chandra Kirti, was he the first to lay out the ten grounds, or did he cite oh, no, no, Nagar, no. or was Nagarjuna the first one to do that? No, 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 no. They're in the, Buddha, in the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras, as uh-huh. far as I know. Okay. Yeah. But it talks about those. And then what is the difference between selflessness and emptiness? Well, my teachers say that two terms are synonymous. They're interchangeable. But um, usually when we use the term emptiness in our tradition, we're talking about emptiness of inherent existence, as the Prasangikas explain it. Um, so I, I kind of, for a long time, I used to think that emptiness was a, was a word that was sort of exclusive to Mahayana and more specifically exclusive to Majjhimika, although the Chittimatras use it as well. <coughs> but, I mean, there's also sutras. <coughs> for example, the Sutra of Golden Light, the Buddha talks about emptiness. But then, I, yeah, I guess that is a Mahayana sutra. But they do, in the Pali tradition, the Pali sutras, they also have the term emptiness. So it's not a term that's exclusive to Mahayana and Majjhimika. Um, selflessness, in a way, is a more common term that is um, common to all the schools, so all different tenet systems and Pali, you know, Pali tradition, Mahayana. They all use that term. That's, And you can use that term, you can say selflessness of phenomena, meaning emptiness of inherent existence. So it's okay to use that term to talk about emptiness of inherent existence. So it's good to be flexible and, um, you know, be able to use both terms. But if just the term selflessness is used, if only selflessness is there, then you have to try to figure out or, or ask, you know, which kind of selflessness are you talking about? Is it the selflessness, uh, you know, of it's the emptiness of inherent existence, or it's, is it the selflessness, which is the absence of a self-sufficient, substantially existent person, and so on. So there's actually different levels of selflessness. It gets complicated, but... Yeah. So the autonomous don't say that you have to realize the subtlest emptiness in order to become fully awakened? No. Oh, to become fully awakened, you do. Oh, but they say that... that Practitioners of the lower vehicle can become arahat. Yeah, just to with get the chorus. Yeah, just to get out of samsara, just to free yourself from samsara, and not have to take birth anymore, and on so on, reach nirvana. Just to reach nirvana, um, one needs to realize selflessness of persons, the the chorus selflessness of persons. So. Absence of an of a self-sufficient, substantially existent person, but there's one complication there in that in the Svatantrika, there's actually two divisions of Svatantrika. There's the Yoga Chara Svatantrikas and there's the uh, Sotrandika Svatantrikas. And the Yoga Chara Svatantrikas. Um, so there's sort of a combination in a way. They're a combination of Chitta Mantra and uh, Majjhimika a little bit. It, it, apparently that school was, the, the founder of that school was Shantarakshita, who was one of the great Indian masters who came to Tibet and had disciples like Shantarakshita, I'm sorry, uh, Kamalashila and um, um, Haribhadra, these are some of his famous disciples. And um, it seems that, you know, because of the earliest of uh, the Tibetan schools is the Nyingma, Nyingma school. So they tend to, it seems, I haven't studied that much, but they tend to follow more his tradition. Anyway, so um, the, the uh, Abhisamailamkara, which is Maitreya's ornament for clear realization, that's one of the main texts studied in the monasteries. That text is actually written according to that school, Yogacara, Svatantrika, Majjhimika. <laughs> and according to that school, they say that um, the three vehicles, hearers and solitary realizers and the bodhisattvas, actually have three different main objects that they meditate on 
to achieve their goals. So for hearers, their main object of meditation is self-sufficient persons. There's no inherent, um, sorry, self-sufficient, substantially existent person. So that's what they meditate on, and that's what they realize in order to attain their goal of, they call it hearer enlightenment or nirvana. And then the solitary realizers, um, in addition to meditating on that, they also meditate on, uh, you know, in the mind-only school, they say the absence of um, duality between subject and object, absence of external existence. So solitary realizers also meditate on that. That's their main object of meditation. And they realize that, and they attain their goal of solitary realizer enlightenment. And then bodhisattvas, um, their main object of meditation is emptiness of true existence, which, yeah, it's better to say true existence rather than inherent existence. So that's emptiness of true existence of all phenomena. So the three vehicles then have different objects that they meditate on. And um, what was the original question? Now I forgot. <laughs> hmm? no, it was... I had asked about um, the autonomist's view on um, becoming a waking by just understanding um, or realizing course selflessness. Right, so that's, that particular school of the autonomist, the Yogacara autonomists, um, they, they say that, you know, you don't have to realize emptiness of true existence in order to get out of samsara, but here is realize course selflessness of persons and... Um, solitary realizers realizes the short term is absence of duality, meaning absence of difference in substance between subject and object, like the cheetah matrins. That's complicated, but he actually he does mention that a little bit later, so I was going to talk about that anyway. Does that make sense? But the other school of autonomous, the Svetantika, uh, Svetantika, they are um, similar to yeah, they're similar to the Satronica, so they don't talk about no external objects and that whole side of things, like in the Chitta Matra. So they're, for them, it would just be hearers in solitary realize, just have to realize um, selflessness of persons, absence of a self-sufficient substantial existence. I wish there was a short term for that, <laughs> um, to attain their goal. So my mind keeps saying that the core selflessness is the permanent unitary independent and the subtle form of selflessness of person is the self Yeah, that's person. according to yeah, that's the into. lower schools. Which but, one is South Tantra? Well, the, below Prasangika, because Prasangika is unique in having, you know, this, or rather I should say Madhyamika. Madhyamika, oh, I'm a little confused here. Anyway, Sometimes it's said that the coarse selflessness of persons is the absence of a permanent unitary independent self. Right. Subtle selflessness of persons is the absence of a self-sufficient. Okay, right. that's more the lower schools. But for the prasangika, because they have the absence of an inherently existing self, they say that's the subtle selflessness. And that the, the, the subtle of the lower schools goes into the coarse form of selflessness from the yeah. prasangika. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's complicated. <laughs> In Meditation on Emptiness, um, somewhere around 300, page 300, they have these, made these very nice charts of all the different versions of selflessness and which ones are coarse and which ones are subtle. And which school, which, which, yeah, it's very complicated, but... <laughs> yeah, so I guess I was speaking more from the Prasangika, yeah. So you want to go on a little bit more? Ten minutes or so? Okay, the next section is a biosense of the translators. This is easy. Okay, so translators meaning the people who translated the uh, Chandrakirti's text from Sanskrit into Tibetan. So what I heard, you probably heard this too, that one of the early kings of Tibet made a, a kind of rule that when they were translating texts from Sanskrit into Tibetan, that they add a homage in the beginning to indicate which of the three baskets this text belongs to. So if, if the text um, belongs to Vinaya, 
the Vinaya basket, then homage is paid to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Oh, homage to the omniscient one, sorry. Homage to the omniscient one for Vinaya text. And if the text belongs to the Sutra basket, homage is paid to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And if it's Abhidharma, homage is paid to Manjushri. So here it's homage to the youthful Manjushri. So this indicates that it belongs to uh, the Abhidharma basket. <clears throat> the meaning of the words is easy to understand. The translators make homage to Manjushri in accordance with a former partitioning of Buddha's word into three scriptural collections, discipline, Vinaya, sets of discourses, sutra, and manifest knowledge, Abhidharma. Since this text, Chandrakirti's supplement, presents ultimate manifest knowledge, and hence the training in wisdom is central. So this text mainly belongs to that basket of um, Abhidharma, or manifest knowledge. So that's pretty easy. Okay, then come to the main text. Scroll down to where it says homage to compassion, under that meaning of the text. <clears throat> and so this section has four parts. Expression of worship, means of beginning to compose the treatise. Two, actual body of the treatise. Three, way that the treatise was composed. And four, dedication of the virtue of composing the treatise. So this is, again, Lama Tsongkhapa's way of um, breaking the text into these four parts. So the first part is the expression of worship, the means of beginning to compose the treatise. So that means Chandrakirti's expression of worship or homage, what he is paying homage to, to start his text. This section has two parts, praise of great compassion without differentiating its types and homage to that compassion within differentiating its types. So first is praise of great compassion without differentiating its types. So just general compassion, general great compassion. The person, the Honorable Chandrakirti, having assumed the task of composing supplement to the middle for the purpose of supplementing the treatise on the middle, not only does not state as his object of worship the hearers and solitary realizers who are taken as object of worship in other texts, but also indicates that, rather than even Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, it is fitting initially to praise great compassion, the most excellent cause of Buddhahood, bearing the nature of thoroughly protecting all protectorless sentient beings bound in the prison of cyclic existence, the main cause called by the name of its effect, the victorious. Okay, so he's saying here that in some texts, the author will start by praising hearers and solitary realizers or Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, but Chandrakirti, uh, in a unique way, um, chose to uh, pay homage to great compassion um, because that is the cause, the cause of Buddhahood and the cause of all these others hearers and solitary realizers and bodhisattvas. And there was some question, I think, when, when we were having teachings with Geshe Lundrup about, is Chandrakirti really talking about great compassion? Because in the verses, he's just saying compassion. <laughs> Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. But in the auto-commentary, Chandrakirti's own commentary to his own text, in there he does use the word great compassion. So it's very clear that he that's what he's talking about. And as Geshe Lundrup said, you know, the supplement of the middle way is in verses. And so when you're doing like in poetry, you know, you have to keep a certain number of syllables in each line. So you sometimes have to shorten things. <laughs> so he just shortened it. He just said compassion, but he meant great compassion. And so also here uh, in this verse, in this paragraph, sorry, he says, um, the most excellent cause of Buddhahood, bearing the nature of thoroughly protecting <clears throat> all protectorless sentient beings bound in the prison of cyclic existence. 
the, we had also had some discussion about um, what is the nature of great compassion. And um, when I was studying this with Kensu, Kensu Gemma Tekchok, um, yeah, he, he's a number of times he explained, and other teachers do as well, that um, hearers and solitary realizers, they have compassion, but their compassion is wishing sentient beings to be free of suffering. They have this strong wish that sentient beings are free from suffering, but they don't have this attitude of wanting to protect sentient beings from suffering. And this is what the bodhisattvas have, and this is what makes it great compassion. Great compassion means you don't just wish sentient beings to be free of suffering, but you are going to do it. You are going to do it. I am going to protect sentient beings from suffering. I'm going to do whatever needs to be done to free them from suffering, to protect them from suffering. So that's what he says in this line here. Thoroughly protecting all protectorless sentient beings bound in the prison of cyclic existence. So that's a kind of explanation of what is great compassion. Okay, and then, so to do this, Chandrakirti utters two stanzas. So now we're getting to Chandrakirti's words. <laughs> Up until now, I think it's just been Lama, it's been Lama Tsongkhapa's words. So the purple, <laughs> it's very helpful of Jeffrey to do that, you know. The purple words, <laughs> purple letters, are um, Chandrakirti's. Hearers and medium Buddhas are born from the monarchs of subduers. The old translation, the original translation, had kings of subduers. And I kind of wanted monarchs. And then I realized he's trying to be gender neutral, <laughs> which is nice. <clears throat> monarchs of subduers. <clears throat> Buddhas are born from bodhisattvas, the mind of compassion, non-dual awareness, in the mind of enlightenment. So those are those three, those three, what did he call it before? The three practices. Yeah, so they're right there. Um, are the causes of children of conquerors. Again, he's being neuter, uh, gender neutral there, because sometimes some translators say sons of conquerors. <clears throat> so children of conquerors is another term for bodhisattvas. Sympathy alone is seen as the seed of a conqueror's rich harvest, as water for development, and as ripening in a state of long enjoyment. Therefore, at the start, I praise compassion, meaning great compassion. So these are Chandrakirti's words, the first two verses of his text, and then Lama Tsongkhapa is going into a very extensive explanation of these, uh, these words. <clears throat> Okay, this has two parts, indicating that compassion is the main cause and indicating that compassion is the root of even the other two causes of a bodhisattva. So um, this is referring to the three causes of a bodhisattva, which are in the third line of verse 1, mind of compassion, non-dual awareness, meaning um, realization of emptiness, and the mind of enlightenment. So those are the three causes of bodhisattvas. And then he's saying here that compassion is the main cause, and it's also the cause of the other two. It's the cause of non-dual awareness and the cause of the mind of enlightenment. So indicating that compassion is the main cause of a bodhisattva, this section has three parts, indicating how the two hearers and solitary realizers are born from monarchs of subduers, indicating how Buddhas are born from bodhisattvas, and indicating the three main causes of bodhisattvas. So the first one is indicating how the two hearers and solitary realizers are born from monarchs of subduers. So I'm not going to repeat the verse because we read that already. So first now he's going into an explanation of hearers. Why are they called hearers? Um, because they listen 
Actually, the Tibetan term usually used for here is, is nyanta. And I think, oh, do, you, do you know? Nyanta. One of those words means listen, and the other one means hear. I forget which one is which. But anyway, literally, nyanta means listener, hearers. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But he's explaining why they're called that. Because they listen to correct instructions from others, and after attaining the fruit of having meditated, i.e. the enlightenment of a hearer, they cause others to hear about that fact. They are called hearers. That's why they're called that. They listen to teachings like from the Buddha. They meditate. They attain their goal of enlightenment or nirvana. And then they cause others to hear about that. If you read in the Pali Sutras, you find this a lot, you know, and one of the Buddha's disciples gets it, you know, <laughs> attains nirvana. Then they say, uh, they say these words, it comes next, it says, with respect to how they cause others to hear, it is as frequently occurs in the scriptures. They say, I have done what was to be done. I will not know another birth, and so forth. Have you come across that before? Buddha's disciples, bing, you know, they get it. Light goes off. I have done what was to be done. I will not know another birth. I'm not going to be born anymore. So this is how they cause others to hear about their accomplishment. So that's the etymology, why they're called this hearer-listener, as in Tibetan. Although there are some hearers, such as those in the formless realm, to whom this etymology doesn't apply, why is that? No body, no mouth, <laughs> no voice. <laughs> um, there is no fault because the features of an etymology do not have to apply to all instances for a term to be used as an actual name. So an etymology doesn't have to apply to every single uh, instance. As is the case, for example, with using Lake Bourne as an actual name for a lotus grown from dry soil. So I think another term for lotus is lake born, but apparently not all lotuses are born in a lake, but that's okay. Or in accordance with the usage of the original Sanskrit for hearer, shravaka, uh, also for hearing and proclaiming. So I guess this is another term for hearer in Tibetan, tudrok. Uh, they hear to, so okay, so to means here. They hear from Buddhas about the supreme fruit or the path proceeding to Buddhahood and proclaim, joke, to those of the great vehicle lineage seeking that path, due to which they are shravakas, hear proclaimers. So that's another reason why they're called that. They hear about Buddhahood and they hear about the path to Buddhahood, the Bodhisattva's path, and they talk about it to others, even if they don't practice it themselves. I remember there was a question about that that was discussed. Well, I don't think that's so strange, is it? I mean, if they hear about Buddhahood and they hear about the Bodhisattva's path and they think, wow, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that fantastic? It's not for me. That's too difficult. I can't do that. But I think it's great that there are people who are doing that. So I'm going to spread the word. Why not? You know, I can praise firefighters and rescue workers and say, wow, it's really great that people do that, but that's not for me. <laughs> yeah? So, I don't know. That's how I think. The White Lotus Sutra of Excellent sorry, the White Lotus of Excellent Doctrine Sutra, this is the Lotus Sutra, says, O Protector, today we have become hearer proclaimers. We proclaim the excellent enlightenment and also intensively set forth the terms of enlightenment. Hence, we are like adamant hearers. <clears throat> Those two reasons are why these bodhisattvas, so apparently that verse is spoken by bodhisattvas, and they're bodhisattvas who are similar to hearers, but not exactly like hearers, you know, just some similarity. But the actual meaning of hearing and pro proclaiming applies only to hearers. 
Is it okay to do it like this? Well, it's good for me. You know, I've studied this text, but then I haven't had the chance to go back and, you know, look at it again. So I, it's, it's just so wonderful, so beautiful. So I'm happy to do this.